you know, you said, you look, look what happens when societies lose their bearings. It's like, yeah, you, that's what convinced me to the degree that I became a religious person. I didn't, it wasn't as if I discovered God. It was more like I discovered Satan or discovered the devil and certainly believed that very powerfully metaphysically or not you don't have to read that much about what happened in nazi germany or what happened in the soviet union or what happened in maoist china what continues to happen in many places around the world to be convinced that there's a great darkness and it seems to me that if there's a great darkness then there has to be a great light and the first part of that is true beyond any hope of refutation and the second seems to be a logical necessity in the light of the first. It's a powerful line that you, uh, you did. I feel so obviously the same. I want to talk to you about the darkness. So I've often said, all of my life really, that we uh, have a wrong metaphor in calling evil dark because it, it's, it's actually so bright that people can't stare it in the face. The number of Canadian or American students at the most prestigious universities who could identify Pol Pot or even the Gulag Archipelago, let alone the Great Leap Forward in China, is so small. The knowledge of evil, it is now up to over a quarter of kids never heard of Auschwitz. It'll be a half very soon. It will be three quarters in a generation. They don't know evil. I, at Berkeley, I was, had a dialogue with two leftist students. My last question to them was, do you believe people are basically good? And they said, yes. And I said, it's a, so demonstrably wrong, that belief, that there's only one possible explanation for why you hold it, because you live in such a good country. Yeah, well, that's the, that's the goodness of naivety, right? And it's something that's, that's encouraged you know you encourage that by producing safe spaces around people you produce that by sheltering them you want to preserve that childlike innocence but once you're no longer a child it's not childlike it's just childish and and that's that's not good to be a 40 year old child and to think that people are fundamentally good it's it's not that good is very difficult it's by no means the default position. What's the default position? Entropy, catastrophe, tragedy, malevolence, and death. That's the default position. The good struggles up against that. That's no easy thing to manage. To think of that as intrinsic. It's an intrinsic possibility, but it's not something that you, it's not something that it's not something that you can manifest without faith and commitment and and the more faith and the more commitment the better and the deeper the better and it's the most difficult of things to do and and it is it, it's appalling to teach people the alternative and, and i know the speak i can speak of this clinically you know the people who are most prone to post-traumatic stress disorder are naive people this is well known clinically. It's, there's nothing about this that's 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 uh, it's questionable or or unorthodox. If you believe that people are basically good and that the world rewards goodness with good in return, if that's your fundamental belief, that there's not really any such thing as evil, and you encounter someone malevolent, which could be yourself. Well, that's often what happens to people who develop post-traumatic stress disorder. You know, they're, they're, it's very common that people develop PTSD because they've done something so incomprehensibly morally repugnant that it's damaged them psychophysiologically and they cannot recover. It's very common among soldiers. It's not what they saw, although sometimes it is. It's what they did. They have no framework within which to conceptualize it. If you have no theory of evil, if you have no theory of good and evil, if you have no metaphysics, and someone malevolent touches you, you're done. And so, telling people that 
human beings are basically good and that evil doesn't exist makes them uh, ripe fruit for the picking by the malevolent. And there's nothing about that that's positive. It's mere cowardice masquerading as virtue. It's the devouring mother in, from the Freudian perspective. I'll keep you innocent. I'll keep you young and naive and nothing will ever come to harm you. It's like precisely the opposite is the case in life. That is why, by the way, I truly, yep. <laughs> that is why I truly believe that a 12 year old at a traditional Christian or Jewish school is wiser and more likely to be happy than a secular professor of philosophy who is 50 years old. Just because I knew I went again to yeshiva, all, so half the day in Hebrew Jewish studies, half the day in English secular studies, I knew at six people were not basically good because God said so in Genesis when he decided to destroy the world because it turned out rotten. So I knew at the earliest possible age, people were not basically good. And it not only affected my Weltanschauung, my worldview, it made me happy. Because then I realized, wow, I'm meeting good people. Despite the fact that people are not basically good, I really do have good people in my life. Am I lucky or what? Yeah, yeah, well, that, that's, a, that's, a really good, that's a really good point. Because, you see, when I said that it was a miracle that we can all sit here peacefully, right. like, that is how I look at it. I, right. I think every day when I walk out into the world and it's not rack and runes and flames and floods that it's a bloody miracle. Right. That we, exactly. I mean it, that we hold this together. Yes. It's not an easy thing to do. Right. And right. peace, to think of peace as the default position is <laughs> a form of deep insanity. Like it's, it, it requires work to, 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 to maintain peace. And you can't be properly grateful unless you understand how unlikely it is that well we're not in the throes of world war three we're not st still in the depths of world war two that the cold war is mostly over that the economic conditions of people everywhere on the planet are improving at a rate that's could only be described as miraculous and that most things are going in a positive direction if you assume that that's normative, then you think, well, that's life, but, and you have no reason to, to be wide-eyed, to have your eyes wide open in admiration and gratitude at the fact that the worst, which has frequently manifested itself, is not knocking at your door at this moment because that's the story of humanity mm -hmm. and not peace and prosperity. So here we have it, and here we should preserve it, and here we should spread it. We should do everything we can to live in a manner that makes that most likely, and we should do that because, well, you said, what did you say? Fear of God. It's like throughout the Old Testament, you know, it's one story after another is that people develop societies and they become arrogant and they wander off the path. and. As soon as they wander off the path, all hell breaks loose. And if you're fortunate enough to be where all hell isn't breaking loose, you should do everything you can to help ensure that we stay the course and walk the straight and narrow path.